Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of How to Not Die Alone by Logan Uri. <laughs> the surprising signs that will help. I think it's How Not to Die Alone, not to be confused with How to Not Die. I what did like I some... say? Did I just say that? Uh, close. You just had the not and the two around the wrong way. <laughs> it's just a this death month, it's a confusing set of titles. How not to die last week and then how to not die alone this week. Yeah. <laughs> Scrolling we, back through those, you could they're very different. They sound very similar, but they're very different. One's health, one's relationships. Shift a few words in any of those sentences and it's a totally different meaning in every book. <laughs> Introduce it. a new word. You got one about love and you got one about <laughs> death. And um, today we're talking about love, man. Love. Valentine's Day. Yeah, close it. No, yeah. no, it's coming next. It's coming, up. It's coming next month. <laughs> it's coming soon though. <laughs> it's, but uh, you might think you shouldn't have to buy a book on love. It should be effortless, natural, organic. You fall in love. You don't have to think your way into it. It's some spontaneous chemical reaction, not a calculated decision. But yet, probably finding love that way hasn't worked out perfectly. It's hard, man. It's hard. It probably hasn't worked out for a lot of people listening right now. It's uh, because the truth is, whilst love feels like a real natural instinct, the dating part isn't, man. Mm. You know, we're not born with this innate ability to know how to choose the right partner. That's it. Logan Yuri, she uh, is a dating coach and a matchmaker. Before that, she studied psychology at Harvard. She spent almost a decade in uh, in the tech sector researching human behavior and relationships. And then eventually she thought, you know what, I want to head down a different path. And she created what she calls intentional love, which is her philosophy for creating healthy relationships. Pretty cool, man. Creating your own philosophy. <laughs> and it's quite a powerful philosophy, definitely when it comes to relationships because really the key idea is that you need to be informed and purposeful in acknowledging your bad habits, adjusting your dating techniques, approaching crucial relationship conversations because the big idea is great relationships are built and they're not discovered. That's it. Lasting relationships, they don't just happen. It's a culmination of a series of decisions, including when to get out there, who to date, uh, how to end it with the wrong person, when to settle down with the right one and everything in between. And making good decisions is what propels you towards that great love story. Making the bad ones, of course, veers you off course and dooms you to repeat those same harmful patterns over and over. So, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, this wouldn't surprise you when it comes to making bad decisions. It's really built in. We're irrational human beings, unfortunately, um, including a chapter in our book, The Shit They mm -hmm. Never Taught You. It was actually, what, a full lesson, right? We've yeah. packed in five or six of the best books we've ever read. And it's not really in our best interest and ability sometimes of making these decisions. We know that, you know, saving for retirement, eating the right foods, you know, all these things that we do in our life, we're very irrational and that applies to dating as well. She says that it's happening more and more than ever that we're actually getting, you know, whilst we've got Tinder, it means you don't have to marry Bobby or Belinda from down the corner because that's all you sort of met. Now you've got options of thousands of thousands of single people in your, in your city or worldwide if you want, but things are getting worse. Who would have thought that having so many options, it just makes life harder because mm. you've got, rather than just Susie or Bobby, I remember being in, um, when I used to be single and on Tinder, I was in Morocco <laughs> once and a lady, she had a, she had a shotgun. I was like, <laughs> so the, yeah, the, the diversity of who you can choose from now goes from <laughs> Susie or Bobby all the way down to, um, I don't forget a name with a shotgun, but it's a big variety now you can choose from. It's an interesting, uh, is it, that was like her first profile pic. On Tinder. Yeah, she was holding a shotgun behind her yeah. head. I'm like, Jesus, I don't know if I'm attracted to that, if that's hot or if it's uh, quite unattractive. I think to some people it would be extremely hot. It, might, it could be working for her. Something different, yeah. <laughs> so basically in this episode, we're going to go over why we suck at dating and how we can do a little bit better. So you want to date? Hash Joe. You're probably not too sure. Um, there's all these myths and preconceptions about dating. It's hard. There's a lot of bad shit that can happen, but thankfully, with uh, the, the philosophy created by Logan, we've got some ways to deal with it as well. That's it. She's boiled uh, most people's dating profiles or tendencies down to three different character types. You know, like if you do like a, what Disney princess are you, one of those personality quizzes, she's, she's done that and worked out your dating profile. The first is the romanticizer. This person, you want the soulmate, the happily ever after, that the whole fairy tale. You want love. Uh, you believe that you are single because you haven't met the right person yet. And your motto is, it'll happen when it's meant to happen. Love it. Well, 
Well, as we'll soon find out, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. not much. Uh, <laughs> then we've got the maximizer. So you're doing some research, you're exploring all the options, you're going on Tinder and swiping through 100 and then you pay for the subscription upgrade and you swipe through another 500 and you're not going to stop until you're confident you found the right one. So you're making your decisions carefully and you want to be 100% certain before anything before you make the choice. So your motto is, why the hell settle? And then the third is the hesitator. You don't think you're ready for dating because you're not the person that you want to be yet. You hold yourself to a high standard. You want to feel completely ready before you start a new project and the same goes for dating. So your motto is, I'm going to wait until I'm a catch before I put myself out there. Now, all three of them, they've got one thing in common, a core root cause, and that is unrealistic expectations. For the romanticizer, they've got unrealistic expectations of relationships. For the maximizer, it's unrealistic expectations of their partner. And then the hesitator has unrealistic expectations of themselves. So these three, you may have recognized yourself in one of these three. Now we'll say, okay, how can you sort of cure it a little bit? How can you head towards a, a better approach to dating? Let's start off with the romanticizers. I think that's probably the most common potentially that thanks to all these Disney movies that it's really built up to be a very unrealistic view of love. Romanticizers, they believe that love is something that happens to you. The reason that you're single is you haven't met the right person yet. You might not consciously identify with fairy tales. You might not be uh, uh, the mermaid or Cinderella or Prince Charming intentionally, but really deep down, that's actually how you view yourself. You think that once your equivalent Prince Charming or Cinderella comes along, love is going to be completely effortless and it's all just going to click and then there you go. So who cares if you're a hopeless romantic, right? You might look at those movies and think, hey, I want to be Cinderella or mm. I want to find Seems like Prince a good Trump. thing to aspire to. But, you know, it, there's a big issue, of course, <laughs> and uh, it really affects how our mindset works towards relationships and the mindset that you bring into it from these fairy tale attitudes is the thing that's really going to cook all your relationships. <laughs> a psychologist, Renee Frenwick. Frenwick? Frenwick? Frenwick. <laughs> Uh, Renee found that people can kind of bring two possible relationships. There's a soulmate mindset, which is the belief that the relationship satisfaction comes from finding the right person. Or you've got the work it out mindset, which is the belief that relationship success derives from putting in the effort. So the soulmate mindset, it's a bit of the Disney style. Um, so first, it affects really the way you're going to go and find a partner. So Logan asked one of her clients uh, why she thought she was single. And she said, oh, it just hasn't happened to me yet. So in someone's mind like that, they're just thinking one day lightning's going to strike and go bang and Prince Charming just walks out of the car and just gives her a kiss and just sweeps her <laughs> off, um, you know, and just waiting and waiting for that. Yeah, that's right. She might think that, you know, it just hasn't happened yet because that magical uh, fairy wand hasn't struck her yet, but it's coming. Or, you know, it also affects the type of people that you're willing to go out with. If you've got this soulmate belief, you've probably got a picture in your mind exactly what they look like, uh, what types of things they do, their physical traits. You know, you might be thinking they're long-haired, light-eyed, fit, muscular, but not too muscular. You know, maybe not like a bad boy covered in tattoos, but a few tasteful little uh, things that are important to them. A bit of a pretty face, but also a bit rugged, a bit of a bad boy look. They're probably tall, but not ridiculously tall. Good hands, they're not chewing their fingernails. And if you see anyone that doesn't match any of those attributes, you're going to think, well, this is clearly not my soulmate, so yeah. I just won't bother dating this person. Sky-high relationships, and they're the worst ones you want to go out on dates with as well, because <laughs> if you know what they are, you're just like, you just go in there trying to look nice, and you can just see in their eye, you go, this, is ain't, <laughs> this ain't Prince Charming. <laughs> well, you just don't, if you crack a joke that's not funny, it just, just got, everything's got a lot more weight to it mm. around this romanticizer type. Definitely. <laughs> There's a few uh, things that romanticizers think and you, if, if the more of these types of statements that resonate with you, the more likely you are to be in this romanticizer category. You might think that love is a gut feeling. You just, you know it when you feel it. Or you might think that when we meet our soulmate, we'll feel an immediate attraction to them. We'll be attracted only to them and they'll only be attracted to us. And that's once we know that that's it. We'll remain passionately in love with our partner all throughout marriage. Uh, we think that it's not sexy to talk about things like money or other logistics because love, it's not meant to be practical. It's just meant to be emotional. Yeah. So, if that sounds like you, you're pretty of a romanticizer and there's a few intensifiers that makes things even more extreme here. And one of them here is Disney's Prince Charming. So, there's a soulmate belief out there that you know the one is somewhere out there and he or she is just going to look exactly like just how you imagined. Yeah, we think that one day we're going to be swept off our feet by a prince or princess charming 
and it happens in every movie, doesn't it? It just the the eyes meet for some reason, and then everything just just works out the way that it's expected. But there's probably maybe one small fight in there, but nothing too major. Mm. It all comes back, and you get married. Like think about it in the Little Mermaid. You know, Prince Eric. Uh, he gets saved by Ariel. He just looks up, and there's this beautiful redhead person with some pretty serious upper body strength to pull him out of the water, and instantly that's it. They fall in love and happily ever after. And we think that that's what's heading to us thanks to Disney. Yeah, same with Cinderella, same with pretty much every movie out there. It has that exact same story arc where everything's obviously perfect and we need to get out of that attitude and we need to find a different one and she calls it the work it out mindset shift because at the end of the day, if you wake up next to Prince Charming, even he has morning breath, you know? <laughs> That's right. There's an old saying that uh, uh, one of my mate's dads used to tell me about women who used to be seem too hard to get. He'd always say, oh, she shits like the rest of us, so don't worry. And it's true. <laughs> there you go. Everyone's going to... Everyone shits. <laughs> That's the moral of the story. Should we end up there? I don't think so. So, no one's perfect, including you. That's it. So, we need to give up on that idea of that instant perfection. So, soulmate thinks that Prince or Princess Charming is coming away. The work it out mindset knows that no one's perfect. So, let's give up on perfection and start looking for, uh, for something a bit more reasonable. So, romanticize our intensifier number two is Disney's happily ever after. So, Disney's at it again, stuffing things up <laughs> and they've got another soulmate belief that they're perpetuating out there. Yeah, so the the second soulmate mindset is saying that the hard work of love is finding someone and then after that, everything's easy. The work it out mindset on the other hand is the belief and understanding that no relationship is easy all of the time. Even the healthiest and the most rewarding and the best relationships that are perceived like that, every single one of them that's good requires a lot of effort. That's right. Disney's saying that the hardest part is just finding someone. Once you found someone, it's all good. Whereas the work it out mindset is saying, okay, finding someone, yeah, it's pretty hard to find someone, but often the real challenge comes later. The hard part, it's the daily work you have to put in to grow and sustain a great relationship. The hard part is feeling excited to see your spouse at the end of the day, even after 30 years and three kids and uh, you know that honeymoon period's long gone, but there's, there's still hard times to come. Now, romanticizer intensifier number three is the, the rom-coms, this meet cute, <laughs> meet cute. It's cute. And it's when you meet. So the soulmate, it's another soulmate belief that's perpetuating out there. It's basically saying that, you know, when you meet the, the person, it's going to be in a phenomenal story that you can just whip out on the wedding day like everyone else does and it's going to be outrageously amazing. That's right. You might think you're, uh, you know, you're strolling through the farmer's market and you find this perfect tomato which is a good shape good size good color and you just reach out for that tomato and just as you do it somebody else is reaching out the exact same time your hands both grab that same tomato at the same time then your eyes lock you've got this intense gaze they tell you about oh i really need this tomato to make my uh italian grandmother's bruschetta uh you know do you want to come over and help me do it uh and then there's this awesome story about how you get all dirty in tomatoes and then get all really dirty later and it's this awesome story <laughs> and yeah you, you think if you just bump into someone on the train or if you just you know someone down the the end of the in your workplace on another desk if you meet them that way and you hate them at first but after six months you decided okay maybe they're not so bad and then after 18 months you finally go on your first date that's a pretty shit story yeah. so yeah. you want you want the meet cute you want that awesome story that you can tell everybody yeah you want to whip out a good story so what we need to do is just stop just hanging out at farmer's markets, <laughs> just like without your eyes, just like gra- grabbing tomatoes and then just just turn to the <laughs> left like, and just hoping just someone's there. Just always holding a tomato, just hoping someone it. tries to grab it. <laughs> it's just not going to work like that. So the work it out mindset shift we need to make and it's the belief that love takes work from finding it in the first place and then also keeping it alive. Waiting around ain't just going to cut it. Um, you need to put effort in again and to go out and find someone and the magic lies in the fact that Two strangers can come together and create a life and it's not really important how they met. Hmm. You probably retrospectively throw a bit of salt and pepper on it. I know, you know, Corey and I, we're going to probably throw a bit of salt and pepper. There's a few <laughs> different ways you can interpret that meeting and <laughs> definitely you just position it in a way that sounds pretty meat cutie. But yeah, it's, that's it's it. all bullshit that's anyway. It. You can make up the story later. You don't. It doesn't have to be a perfect story straight off the bat. You can meet them however you want and then you can shift your own story yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, you, with a few years, you can sort it, it Get to be blurry and just fill in a few spots the way you want to fill it. That's it. So don't worry about about waiting for that perfect moment. So that's romanticizer. It's it basically the romanticizer's cook. Don't stop watching Disney movies or you can watch them, but don't take them too seriously because that's very rarely how it works in the real world. 
Yeah, well, every step of the way, just don't watch Disney movies, I think, in here. <laughs> oh, mate, they're fantastic movies, but just don't think that it's real life. Well, it's unrealistic expectations in every exactly. hero's journey story, whether it's oh, love yeah. or the other stories as well. It just doesn't really work like that, <laughs> That's uh, right. always anyway. That's right. So we've said the romanticizer is cooked, and we've given you a few ways you can shift to that work it out mindset. Now, let's look at the maximizer. They're also pretty cooked. Yeah, they're not good either. <laughs> no, we've done, what was that book called? The Paradox of Choice. You know, the maximizer, they're obsessing over making the best possible decision. They might be thinking, you know, I've got this, I've got this uh, nice, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend at the moment, but there's a few things that piss me off. Well, surely I can find someone that's like two or 3% yeah. better. You know, I can ditch them and try again. And there, there might be, you know, marginal improvements. That's the maximizer mindset. Always thinking, have I got the absolute best possible match? Have I hit 100% satisfaction on everything? Yeah, and you can do it in every walk of life. If you're watching a movie, you can scroll through IMDb for, what, two and a half hours <laughs> by the time you've scrolled through it and trying to find a, a movie that's a, you know 8.7, which is fitting that horror story which you're hoping to have on a Sunday or whatever. You could have watched a whole film by then. <laughs> that was a 7.7 7 yep. and amazing and satisfied and you're going to bed. So, you know, there's a huge cost when it comes to being a maximizer in every walk of life. Yeah, that's all right. Maximizing often leads to this anguish, you know, delays in decision making, missed opportunities. As we said in that the other book a couple of years ago, Paradox of Choice, also the maximizers, even if they do make a decision, they're always second guessing it and wondering, oh, is this the best possible one? So they don't actually enjoy the decisions as much, even though they put so much more effort into making those decisions. Now, if you are a satisfier, sir, there's good news because once you make a call on who they are, then you got something that's going to be on your side and that's actually your brain, good old brainy, oh, right? Yeah. Because once we commit, we always post-rationalize anything we do that why well, it's the right choice. So it's right. a, we always stuff things up and then just find a way to convince ourselves it was the right decision. So Absolutely. If you think, uh, I think back, you know, a year ago, we spent six or seven months trying to find a house. You go through all the, the websites, looking at all the listings. You spend all weekend looking at open houses and you, you think there's so many options that we could possibly go to. As soon as you buy one, you're like, oh yeah, that was the perfect, oh. that was the absolute best possible choice we could have made because your brain just tells yourself, oh yeah, it had the, the big kitchen so now you can cook or oh, it's near the golf course so you can mm. just walk to the, oh. even though before I had no interest in golf, but then you buy the house and you're like, oh, this is the perfect house and you rationalize it. The same thing happens in your relationships too. Even though you may not have done the maximizer approach of turning over every single stone to find a 100% right match. If you make a decision, your brain starts to then tell yourself that this is really good. You know, at first you might have thought, oh, they're into rock climbing, that's super weird. And all of a sudden you go and you're like, oh, this is actually really fun. I'm, I'm, I like that they take care of their health and they've got an interesting hobby. And you, your brain starts to tell yourself that you made a good decision. It certainly does. You'll get there eventually, unless what they've done, you know, <laughs> it's really bad, you know. <laughs> a few caveats always but uh, if you think about it you know I've actually just finally started watching Breaking Bad I'm about oh, what, 15 years behind but you know even the wife at first she wasn't into it but then she starts to kind of she get does. she starts she to does. rationalize it oh actually it's, it's pretty, pretty good cool. idea yeah there's a bit of cash <laughs> bit of cash money there but we haven't obviously got to the end so no, halfway wanna, through oh, yeah three. I don't want to uh, spo no spoiler alerts here <laughs> now finally we've got the hesitator so you know you got Sad Sack Sammy here I'm guessing it's one of her clients again <laughs> Not everyone talks about their clients like that, but <laughs> I've never had a girlfriend. Okay, you know, maybe one in high school, but I haven't since then. You know, why do you think that is? And he goes, oh, I've never really felt ready. I just wanted first to get my job in order. And when I've got a great job, I'm going to have all this cash and everyone will be attracted to me. And then I'll go to the gym and get fit and get some, you know, a 10 out of 10 partner. So it's going to come. Yeah, there's always some new reason, as you say. Oh, I haven't got a job yet, so I can't get a girlfriend. Oh, I'm about to get a promotion, so I can't get a girlfriend. Oh, I haven't got enough money yet, so I can't support a future wife. Oh, you know, I need to lose five five kilos before I'm a, a bit of a catch to put myself out there and find someone. There's always these reasons that you can give yourself if you're a hesitator not to go out there and start dating. You know, it's you could probably get it right because it's there's probably fear underlying everything, and fear is what really paralyzes the hesitators out there. When it comes to a lot of things, but you know, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of not being good enough, you know, no wonder you avoid dating. <laughs> but the truth is, you can't really fail at something that you never attempt, right? Yeah, the uh, you miss out on a lot if you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. It's like anything. If you do it more, you'll get better at it. If you do more dates, you'll get better at, at dating. You'll get better at recognizing what works for you and what doesn't. If you just keep putting it off and putting it off, the pool's going to thin out, and Ooh, you, yeah. once you finally think, okay, you know, I'm, We're I'm, in. you know, I'm 39 years old now. I don't want to be a 40 year old virgin. It's time to go out and start dating. You got no idea what the hell you're doing, yeah. so you're going to be pretty bad at it. All so, the good ones have been snapped <laughs> up by then. That's right. So don't be a hesitator. Yeah. What's that quote, Ash? Show there. 
you know, by Jordan, I miss all the shots that I don't throw or something like that. <laughs> someone can Google it. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone Google it. Someone said something like that. <laughs> That's a strong finish to that, that <laughs> section. <laughs> I'll ask you the listener to Google it when they go into the gym. And I didn't even know. It's not the role of the, the, the listener. It's the role of the podcast that has sort of come up with the, the, the right ending. Anyway. Okay. So, we went through the three uh, potential negative mindsets that you can bring into, uh, into dating. Now, let's shift to a bit more medium term and let's think about what you actually look for in a partner. You might have gone on a bunch of dates how do you start to think, okay, this is more than just a date. This could be a potential more serious partner. You know what? You know, we're all talking about this big spark that happens. Like, whoosh, and you feel alive, you're tuned in, you're turned on. The spark is wonderful. But you know what she says? She says, fuck the spark. You know, mm. the concept is her nemesis in her whole philosophy she, she's created. Um, and she's come to see that the obsession with this spark is one of the most dangerous mm. ideas going around when it comes to dating. Yeah. You know, she might have a someone comes to her and says, oh, you know, we've been on two or three dates, but there was just no spark there. She says, fuck the spark. And there's a whole bunch of myths around the spark. The first myth is that when you find the right person, there's just going to be instant fireworks. You yeah. just think, okay, as soon as you just lock eyes for the first time, something goes on inside or maybe literal fireworks are going on. And you think, okay, this is this is the spark, this is the one. Yeah, and the sex is just awesome, and you're just all about the sex and the spark, and it's all <laughs> blah blah blah. It's not it's not that great, really. It's not really how good relationships chips work. The love at first sight um, is a myth, also. So you know, if you look around, a lot of the time, a lot of people who get together, they might just be colleagues, or they might be neighbours, and it's not because of a spark. It's more correlated with just the mere exposure effect, right? <laughs> They're just spending more time around each other. And because of that, you know, there's something actually growing and brewing rather than just sparking. Yeah. She says that, that instant chemistry is not necessarily a thing. It probably, again, back to Breaking Bad, maybe that chemistry, maybe the formula uh, evolves over time and gets better and better and better. And she's got a story here. There was a, uh, a waitress at an Italian restaurant when she first started working there. One of the chefs asked her on the date and she says she wasn't attracted to him. Uh, I guess he probably didn't meet that idea of Prince Charming. So she said no. And he said, okay, yeah, sure thing. We'll just be going back to work colleagues. But then eventually, six months later, he drove her home from a shift one night. And then he said again, you know, what about how about a day? And after six months, she thought, oh, maybe I've, I've grown to become somewhat interested in this person. And as you say, that mere exposure after working together for six months, they started to feel a bit more familiar with each other. She started to feel a little bit more safe around him, a little bit more attracted to him. And then all of a sudden, they get married. They've got two kids. And yeah. uh, happily ever after. There you go. Uh, through working, working through it. Not yeah, working not, through yeah. it. Not, <laughs> not through any sparks there. Yeah. But that's all, you know, that story of that spark at the start, it's, uh, it's all a bit of BS. So, don't fuck it, according to Logan. That's it. The spark can grow. It doesn't have to just instantly. It could be just a very small fire and then gradually builds up over time. It doesn't have to be instant, you know, uh, spontaneous combustion. It's probably going to be more like a tiny flame sparking for, for breath, right? Like mm. if it's... It's a tiny spark that you actually needs to, to grow and actually build from somewhere. And then now the second myth is that the spark is always a good thing. And the truth of that myth is it's not. Some people are just really good at making sparks. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are just, they maybe they go to the gym a lot. Maybe they're extroverts. Maybe they've been flirting with a lot of chicks in the past. Or maybe, you know, it's just the... They've just got some natural charisma about them that just gives everyone a bit of a spark when just when you meet them. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've always had this theory. It's pretty similar to this. Like uh, someone who's really good at Tinder game is not well mm. correlated with someone who's good, you know, good actually as a good long-term partner. According to her here, it's pretty similar in life. If they're really good at selling themselves on the first date, then maybe it's not, you know, the ones who are strongly correlated with someone who's actually going to be very good in the long term. Yeah, that's right. I'm, the next, and I'm reading a new book for next season around you know job interviews and hiring and the the idea of a job interview is strange for picking someone for a job because that you know having a 20 minute zoom call and then it's going to be the person who's you know really confident and charismatic that comes across really well in a job interview it's got nothing to do with the actual job that they're about to do so a job interview is not really the best uh, qualifier for picking someone for a job similarly that spark is not necessarily a good indication that someone's actually going to be a long term a good long term partner yeah, I like it. So, we're going to stop believing, Ash Joe, if, if a dependable person out there doesn't give us butterflies, then it mustn't be love because it still could be love there. It's just not the anxious kind that's just giving you butterflies. So, we're going mm. to separate the two. So, at the end of the day, we need to ditch the idea of the spark for the slow burn, right? Mm. Get that little little flame, 
let it burn up and grow into a wildfire, not wait for this huge spark at the very start because it's not true. That's right. She says that uh, most of us don't really date for long-term viability. When you're going, as you say, when you're scrolling through through Tinder, when you're first going on the dates, you are thinking about, is that spark there? Is this the Prince Charming? Do they look good? Have they got a good job? Have they got plenty of money? Uh, are they someone I can you know show off to my family and friends? This is what the author Logan, she calls this pursuing the prom date. We want someone who looks great in pictures, someone who gives you a night of fun, uh, someone who makes you look cool in front of your friends. The truth is that, you know, we finished high school a fair while ago that we shouldn't be looking for prom dates anymore. They served a purpose at the time, but now if you, you don't want to marry the prom date. Yeah, have a think of it. Do you really want to marry that type and then have a real deep think about it because you might just try and get rid of that conception about who's actually going to make your life life better because when we're looking for a long-term partner, we probably want someone who's going to be there the whole time through the highs and the lows, someone you can rely on, someone you can help make decisions with. This is more of a life partner, which she calls, rather than the promy. She goes deep on the things that we think matter a lot, but actually in truth matter a lot less than we think and vice versa as well. So there's a few things that are important, but not uh, monumentally important like we think. So she said money, you know, it's in, money matters, but once you're above the keeping your head above water, money doesn't matter a whole lot. Good looks, she says, definitely doesn't matter. It might be nice when you're young, but everyone gets old. Uh, so good looks doesn't matter so much. Interestingly, she says shared hobbies, not that important either. Everyone can just have their own hobbies. You know, you don't have to start taking up ballet uh, just, to, just to have a good relationship. Shared hobbies are not so important. It's probably more important is that you can both do your own hobbies without intruding on the other person. And then what matters more than we think, she says, is emotional stability and kindness, loyalty, someone that brings out the best in you, someone that can make hard decisions, someone that just doesn't get really pissy and you have a fight and you blow up and that's it. You need to actually work through the fight together. They're the things that are much more important. That's shifting from the prom date to the life partner. That's probably where our brain is irrational, man, because I think we probably are wired to go after those things that don't matter that much, like you said, the looks and the money and stuff and not always we're looking for the things that really matter. So, we need to do, shift away from that idea from the prom date and sort of mature out of it as we get out of uh, puberty because we're not 15 anymore, Ash Joe. Mm. We were then and it made sense then. We're not like that anymore. We're talking a long time, waking up next to the same person forever. You don't want them to be a shocker. <laughs> you want them to have the right qualities which is going to make your and their life better. So remember, we spoke about that happily ever after fallacy, that mistaken belief that the hard work of love is about finding someone. But as we said, the, the next hard part is also hard too about making that relationship last for the long haul. And that's really what we're all about. We're not all about just finding Prince Charming and uh, get married and happily ever after. It's about putting in the effort to actually create intentional love. So our, our new generations, fewer and fewer of us now are finding a long-term relationship satisfaction but there is hope. We're not all destined to have a really shit, disappointing relationship because great relationships are created and not discovered. You can form a lasting bond by putting in the work. So the opportunity to build the relationship of your dreams, it's not something that you just leave to the fairy tales. It's something that you can have. It's not just the spark though. It's something that you can choose to work towards. 